you know, like you said or a little bit earlier in your rant, there is a lot of noise out there. And so, you know, for people kind of just finding Bitcoin, you know, maybe they hear about the, you know, Ethereum or some of these other shit coins in the merge. You know, we were, uh, I was lucky enough to join you at the financial summit and I heard like a, you know, you had a great Ethereum versus Bitcoin debate. Um, so like, you know, what would you do to, to, to who's somebody who approaches you and kind of ask you more so about Ethereum opposed to Bitcoin? Like, how do you kind of sway that person to say, you know, it's Bitcoin and Bitcoin only? Yeah, I mean, like, look, like shitcoiners, you know, I think that they have different goals than Bitcoiners. Uh, Bitcoiners are really, it's about separating money and state. Um, if you don't separate money from state, you kind of end up with the status quo. Um, if you don't, and that also goes down to the design philosophy and the architectural philosophy, right? Because Ethereum has so many features and so much more smart contract capability, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's a lot more hardware intensive, meaning you need a, a specific, you need a, a certain amount of hardware capacity in order to run an Ethereum node that causes the majority because the barrier to entry is is very high, right? You, you, you buy a Bitcoin node. This thing is like, you know, it could be anywhere between 300 and 900 if you want it pre-made point is though, like it's affordable. It's not, you know, super cheap, but it's affordable. You could do it super cheap by just running one on your computer. If you really want to Ethereum, you can't do that. It's very, very hardware intensive, meaning you need to spend thousands of dollars just to run a node. So what happens? The majority of Ethereum nodes are, and we know this, it's verifiable. Uh, the majority of Ethereum nodes, around 60%, are run on Amazon web servers. Sorry, on servers. Of that 60%, 50% of that are run on Amazon web servers. And then the rest are run on Oracle, Google, and a bunch of other tech companies, but it's it's really a handful. So if the majority of your nodes of your network are run by a handful of companies, it's just a matter of time between before the US government starts knocking and says, hey, you guys need to run something called an OFAC compliant node. And OFA, OFAC is the Office of Foreign Asset Control. They're basically, they're, they get to decide what people, what companies, what American companies, who they can do business with overseas. They're responsible with the sanctions, right? So US current, current U.S. sanction policy is not compatible with how Bitcoin works, right? Bitcoin is the money of enemies. Anyone could use Bitcoin. Problem with Ethereum is that the U.S. government really already has them by the ball sack. And not only that, when they migrate to proof of stake, it becomes even worse because the biggest stakers are exchanges. And I was telling you this stuff before it even happened. And what we've witnessed in the last two weeks, which is obvious if you look at the game theory, um, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, the U.S. Treasury, sanctioned for the first time in its history an open source software. Usually they sanction an individual. Usually they sanction a, uh, a country. But for the first time in its history, they are sanctioned in software. Why were they doing that? They were sending a message saying, hey, the United States government is still in control here, right? How long until they say, hey, you can only run an OFAC compliant Bitcoin node or you're breaking sanctions? They're already setting the precedent. Bitcoin is an open source software. So how long until they, it's, it's like in a couple of years, you don't think it's going to be too crazy after what we've witnessed the last two years? Of course, it's going to happen. And if you're cryptocurrency and only bitcoin has achieved this is not fully decentralized it will inevitably be captured by regulators by governments so again if you're trying to get rich trying to get a lambo trying to speculate on on ethereum you know they have a hell they have a hell of a marketing team right they'll say hey it's deflationary hey it's whatever dude ethereum doesn't have a, a, a cap supply you're really going by whatever Vitalik says, whatever the foundation says, and you're taking what they say at face value, period. And if we look at history, so many examples of society starting out with sound money and then push comes to shove and that specific government has so much political pressure and they start debasing the currency to print more money, to pay for the things, to pay for government services that they paid their promised their people to get votes. 
and they start debasing their money, the currency, and it doesn't become sound. And you have the moral decay of society that I believe comes with the debasement of currency, right? And with Ethereum, it doesn't fix any of those issues because the fact is that the monetary policy of Ethereum is still in the hands of human beings and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So if you have a group of individuals, and I'm not telling, I'm not saying that Metallic or any of the people in the Ethereum Foundation are necessarily evil. But the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Now, what Bitcoin did is it separated the monetary policy out of the hands of human beings, meaning even if I'm Michael Saylor and I say, hey, I want to change the cap supply of Bitcoin, you couldn't unless you convinced everybody that was running a node to change that code and to fork Bitcoin. Now, if I'm running a node, if I'm a little pleb that has 0 0.0001 Bitcoin, what incentive do I have to change and run that software that changed the cap supply of Bitcoin? None. Now, with Ethereum, they could force that because, again, only a handful of companies are running Ethereum servers. I mean, Ethereum nodes. 60%, the majority are running that. So the U.S. government on a theoretical basis, not even theoretical anymore because it's starting to play out can and will capture this and they will change it to better fit their own survival and the bureaucracy really depends right on their ability to print an unlimited amount of money that's how they pay themselves that's how they pay for the social programs to get votes that's how they pay for the wars to pay off the defense contractors that's how they do those things and bitcoin basically says dude it doesn't matter how powerful you are unless you convince everybody. It's not democratic. It's not consensus. It's like, yo, unless you convince everybody running their own independent node, hey, these are the changes. You go with it. Can't do anything. You're just going to be running a shit coin, a fork of Bitcoin. And that's actually what happened in 2017 when the most powerful mining conglomerates got together and they tried to make changes to the Bitcoin network, making bigger blocks. But the problem is that if they made bigger blocks, they would increase the hardware requirement to run a node, meaning they would be sacrificing decentralization. And they tried to do that, the most powerful Bitcoin companies, and they couldn't because the community said, nah. With Ethereum, they can't say nah because they're not the ones actually running the servers. Companies are. And companies are extremely prone to government coercion. A company at the end of the day, they just want to pay. They just want to make money. They want to pay their employees. Employees want to go home. It's up to the individual to make this change. And Bitcoin empowers the individual and Ethereum does not. Ethereum empowers the Ethereum foundation and you're getting along you're, and people are going along in the ride in the hopes of riches. Whereas in Bitcoiners, Bitcoin empowers you, the individual, if you take self-custody. Ideally, you should run your own node. But it empowers you and only you. And that's it. There is no, like, Michael Saylor is going to benefit from the pump just as much as you. Period. Full stop. He runs a node and he's like, yo, I want to change this to enrich myself. You're looking at him like, yeah, dude, that's not going to work. Right? So that's the fundamental difference between something like Ethereum something like XRP, and something like Bitcoin. Bitcoin put decentralization above all, which is why it's very simple. It's not complicated, simple by design. And Ethereum does all these, has all these bells and whistles, but what they never talk about is what they've sacrificed in order to make those bells and whistles. So yeah, that's the difference between the two.